Yeah. All right, cool. As, if people choose to join in from here on out, that's cool. But let's get started. Um, there was going to be a mix of people here from different genres. Uh, I know everybody's been invited to probably a million Zoom calls this week, so I get it if they forget about this one. Uh, but it's still, this is why I want to record it because I'm going to put it out there anyway. The goal here was to just, we talk about business on day to day and when the market's good, when the market's stable, uh, preparing for the next time that the market comes to a halt or there's a, there's a, a bad point in your business. And then what do you do? How do you adjust? How do you pivot? Pivot seems to be the popular word this week. And seemingly overnight, we had to do that in our business. There was a pivot in like a 48 hour period because as real estate investors, our business is lead driven. Leads have to come in, we talk to them, we get houses, we buy the houses, we do whatever we're gonna do with them and that's how we make our money. So when the leads shut off like a light switch, now what? You can either lay down and die or you have to make some kind of a change. Gene, what's up? We just got started, Gene. Um, talking about pivoting, that seems to be a popular word this week. So. Uh, that's where I want to start. This is going to be interactive. I'll give my little piece. And if anybody want to, wants to add to that, I invited Stacy here for a specific reason. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so in our business, as I was saying, in real estate investing, as, as we're lead driven and the lead shut off overnight, what do we do? Uh, what we decided to do, and I'll share that with everybody here, is our business model is we get phone calls, we set up appointments, we go meet with people, and we get contracts. Uh, the meeting people part seems to be uh, the killer in our business right now. So we uh, seemingly overnight changed to a close over the phone business. We dug back into our database, followed up with people we haven't talked to in a while, followed up on appointments we went on recently in the past month or so, because just because we're on lockdown or quarantine or whatever, uh, doesn't mean that there's not motivated people out there. There's still people that need to sell their homes. And the assumption from a lot of the people that we're talking to on the phone is that Everybody shut down, meaning there's no, there, nobody's doing any business anywhere. And it's very surprising when you get somebody on the phone and say, look, we are still doing business. And through the data that we can pull, um, thanks to technology nowadays, we can pull some information on the computer and through a conversation that's a little bit different than we're used to having. It's, it's a lot of trust base. We can make an offer over the phone, assuming that we're going to see some pictures or get some pictures from the seller. And in one case, we actually FaceTimed an appointment where they walked around their house and showed us stuff that we asked for. Let me see the important stuff. I wanna see the roof. I wanna see uh, windows maybe, or I wanna see the kitchens and the beds and, and the big the, you know, the big ticket items you assume to look at for a rehab anyway. So uh, in 48 hours, we learned how to close over the phone really quickly. And we followed up with all of our database, which had about 400 plus leads in there. and we were averaging before this uh, pandemic hit, we were averaging probably one or two contracts a week, belly to belly appointments, meeting with the sellers. And through this uh, need to learn quickly or else you're gonna go out of business phase, we closed two contracts yesterday over the phone. So it's doable, there's, there's that business to be made. Now the trick is, because there's, there's another level to this, uh, usually you would get a contract signed and you know how the rest is gonna play out since it's a celebratory moment. Not necessarily like that now because now we have to figure out the rest of this trail. We have the contract, but what now? Do the sellers that just signed my contract, are they able to go find another place? Because most likely they're gonna to have to go in person and go see their next place if they don't have it lined up already. So that, that's gonna create maybe a longer close time for us. So we're preparing for that um, through some conversations. And uh, really an important point to put out there is, is contacting everybody in your network. Talk to people you haven't talked to in a while, even if you haven't needed them, and, and kind of see how they're dealing with this, uh, meaning lenders and meaning realtors and anybody that would have a hand in your business whatsoever. We reached out to our title company because we heard they were closing down. How are you conducting business moving forward? And we closed the deal. Well, I'll tell you about the deal. We had a deal that was ready to close, title was pulled, and something came up on the title that uh, there was a deceased party on the deed and they died uh, almost 20 years ago. So although we got the title back, now we have to figure that out because there was never any estate open. Uh, there was never any you know, monies that were uh, taxed on that. So now the sale of the property, somebody's getting taxed somewhere. So the attorney had to reach out. Typically this could be, this could be a longer process. Uh, thankfully we got 
that done in about four days. The attorney was awesome on that. And we had to go back to the courthouse where we thought that was going to be held up. When we got the number back, it was last Thursday. And title agent reached out and said, all right, we can finally close this property out. Let's do it tomorrow before things get any worse because we don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to let us come to work? Uh, so we, we scheduled that for lunchtime on Friday. I got another phone call late that night on Thursday that was, we're closing shop <laughs> and nobody's allowed in the office on Friday. So now what do we do? And uh, this is kind of the point of this as a business owner or as anything in life, I think Stacy's going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, you need to make decisions on the fly and how do we keep the ball rolling? So that's, that's what we did. We came up with some solutions that worked. We uh, essentially created a title agent in the course of 20 minutes. And on behalf of the title company, we were able to go out to the seller's house because they weren't letting anybody in the building. And through the use of technology, we used FaceTime to witness a signature being signed so that we could notarize that once the DocuSign was sent back. I met with the buyer on the buyer's side and got that paperwork signed. And through DocuSigns, FaceTime, and just driving back and forth to different places, Amazingly, we were able to close that property out. I don't think everyone's going to be uh, that easy, or I shouldn't say that easy, but that smooth. It went pretty smooth. Moving forward, ha what does this process look like? Because nobody knows when the end of this is, right? But we still have to conduct business. So we've actually had conversations with the title company, and you know that went really well. So how do we do this moving forward? <clears throat> so we have a couple of titles that came back between yesterday and today. How do we close these out? There's going to be people that are uncomfortable sitting together, get it. In some places, you're not allowed to get it. So how do you move that, move that forward uh, from here on out? And I think we're, we're getting more comfortable closing on the phone, so that's not a problem. The title company has been working with us tremendously, so that's not a problem. Um, getting the title seems to be an issue in some counties. Most counties that were electronic is not a problem. I don't see that slowing our process down at all. Some of the counties that are antiquated uh, are learning really quick how to put their information online. And that's kind of uh, what we've done in the past four or five days to kind of keep the ball rolling. Uh, Cause we need, you know, we need, this is how we put food on our family's table. So um, I see a bunch of investors on here. One uh, famous marketer is in the middle of my screen. Um, Kind of what are you seeing in your world? I want this to be more interactive, right? So what are you seeing in your world? Uh, what are you doing in your businesses to make sure that you keep that ball rolling? If anybody wants to chime in, you're more than welcome. Chris, how you doing, buddy? No, what's up? I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, it's good to see your face. Um, yeah, you too. Thank you. I, um, so from my perspective, I'm on the marketing side. I'm I have a background in investing in wholesaling, flipping, all that good stuff. So I know the game, but I do a lot of work for realtors. I think right now what you're doing with that challenge, the lead video, and, and I'm, the only reason why I'm saying it because I'm doing it too, and I'm seeing unbelievable support and reach and all kinds of stuff coming from it. And so what I think, what I, think I learned very quickly in, the, in all this is that there's, and this is sort of more human related, not business related, but I think if you attack the human side of it, it will generate business. So what I'm finding is, is that people are looking for a break from all the scare tactics and all the BS that's going on online right now. And so I'm generally, not generally, I'm, I'm an optimistic enough guy where my wife calls me delusional. So I, I'm very happy to spread my, my thoughts and my cheer and the type of beer I'm drinking and and I think for five or six minutes a night, people tune in that know me and maybe that don't know me and they like, they like that there's a little bit of levity to it. And I'm telling you, I, I would say four clients at a minimum came out of the woodwork over the last six days of doing it and not because I'm saying anything salesy in it at all. No, I'm not even talking about what I do. I think people are doing the research, they know what I'm doing and they go, you know what, I need to listen to this guy a little bit more and I think I want to do it. And in your case... Well, I, for, in the real estate field, this is what I'm talking to my clients about. It, let's say this goes on for eight weeks. There's a lot of stuff that can be done in that eight weeks to get somebody prepared to let go of the estate when you guys are ready. So maybe there's an opportunity from a marketing or from, from a, you know, a Chris and Mel perspective 
to put together a very short, quick video series or a PDF checklist on, hey, if you're thinking about getting rid of your estate or selling your property after this is all done, here's some, real, here's some really good tips to get that thing ready to go so when this coronavirus is over, bang, you can move and maybe get your, you know, I mean, people are gonna be faced with foreclosures, People are going to be faced with being four months in arrears. So like you guys are sitting on a spot, I think the investor side are sitting on a spot where there's, there, it sounds awful. Like not, you're obviously not going to take advantage of people, but you, but there's an opportunity, I think, to take advantage of a situation while you're helping people. And I think I have, a, I have a divorce attorney too, and I'm walking her through the whole process of like, we have to be ready. And when this is over, you need to be ready to pounce on the, on the women that want to kill their husbands. Like it sounds <laughs> awful as an ambulance chaser, but you got to be ready. So, so that's my thing. I think compassion right now for me is, is accidentally working in a really, really big way. Um, I'm just doing stuff to keep people's mind off of it. We jump on house party every night with my family. I think it's just staying in people's face. I love the fact that you hit your, your, your database like right off the get go. I think people are, listen, I'm not calling you because I want to know. I'm, I'm not calling you because I want to know if I can buy your house. I'm calling you because I want to make sure that everything's in order. Oh, you didn't know about the stimulus plan. Here's how you might qualify. Oh, you didn't know that people, you should call your bank. Oh, you didn't. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Let me know if I can help with anything. I got friends that can help. So I think the compassion piece of that I'm done. I'm sorry. I think the compassion piece of that is, is, is going a long way right now. And I think if you practice that, you're going to win. Karma is a good thing, right? <clears throat> Exactly right. No, I agree with that 100%. And uh, we did maybe one or two short videos. I like the video series idea. That's a, a great information to put out there. Um, we put a video out the other day, uh, really targeted towards wholesalers and realtors, because just like us, I was talking in the, in the beginning, we have deals that we want to push through. We, we still have business that we want to do throughout this whole thing. So uh, keeping in front of those people and letting them know we're not shutting down just because we can't leave our front door. Through the use of technology, we can still, we can still make this work. But there are people that have deals that are starting to pull out of deals. Uh, I've heard some horror stories about the iBuyers, the um, Zillow and the whatever the other one is, Open House, uh, are starting to pull out of the deals that they had under contract. So wow. uh, we want to put the message out there to realtors and wholesalers that have things under contract or maybe buyers or sellers are lined up with a, a transaction that are, that are starting to fall apart. We're still funded. We're still doing business. And, and that's the message we wanted to put out there that, we may be able to not necessarily have 100% of the terms that you have on paper, but maybe we can get close. Yeah, and, and to your point, I, one thing I heard the other day that I thought was very interesting is that it sounds, it sounds like very shark infested waters, but somebody said to me, you know, there's 5% of our, you know, attrition is going to happen in your business. It doesn't matter where you work right now. It's, it's investing, it's marketing. I've had people call me right now and just go, look, I'm not going to be able to close a deal in, in seven weeks. I got to put this on hold. You know, I mean, I want to keep you, but I get it, right? Like, I want you to continue to pay your marketing fees to me, but I totally understand that. Um, but what I heard the other day was, I, I, are you okay if I share a story too, real quick? Absolutely. Um, and I shared this on my live the other night, so this might, you might have heard this before, but there's going to be attrition, but they, I heard somebody say this, that 5% of the people out there right now are licking their chops. And, and why, why is that? Right? Yes, I see Paul saying I am. <laughs> Why is that? It's because because there is business to be had, because there's deals to be made, right? So like, so here's one of the things I thought the other day. This is why I did this on the live. If anybody in on this live is anywhere near Aston PA, there's a sandwich shop out there called Wolf Superior Sandwiches. And I've been dying to try these guys for two years. And logistically, they're like 15, 16 miles from me. It just has never worked out where I've been in that area and they don't deliver, right? And so I saw something come out on this food foodie thing that I'm on. And what he, what the owner said was, we're thinking about delivering outside of our area. Like we're just going to drive 30 miles and out. All I'm asking, we're not going to increase the price of the food. And I'm not going to, all I want you to do is, would you be willing to pay a $10 driver's fee for my driver? Uh, he'll get, or she'll get the whole thing. And I'm like, this is my chance. I'm going to jump on it. Their menu looks amazing. We're sitting in here by ourselves. We can help a local thing. Right. So we order for seven o'clock at night. The driver gets here and like me being a how I am, I'm like, how's it going? It was like the first day. He goes, dude, we're, we were out of food at 530. You're lucky you called at three. And I'm like, interesting. What, how's this going with this whole thing? And I, I dropped the guy 23 bucks. I know people will be cheap when they tip, but I, there's other people that will be generous, right? So I said, is it worth your driving out? He's like, hell yeah. We delivered to the Upper Darby Police Department, like all these crazy things. And I said, what do the numbers look like? He said, 
we're doing decent business in our general area, but we're doing 400 times the business, 4X the business outside the area. These, this guy is actually running out of food every single day too early. Because, so people are employed, drivers are making money, your boy's getting fat, right? So all these things, but, but it made me think, in your business where you're at, there's going to be little opportunities that you got to seek out. And if you can find out what they are, you're going to be part of that 5%. Right. Exactly right. And that was to my point before where some people are just sitting back not knowing that they have an option. And uh, that's, that's where that voice is really important is to get in front of people and let them know whatever you're doing and whatever you can do to help people out, let them know more so than ever. It's really easy in good times and good markets to just fall over deals. Uh, and these, th- these are the times that, how do I wanna word this? You listen to enough podcasts and you, and you read enough books and if you're an entrepreneur, uh, our whole world is, revolves around. Um, I don't wanna steal any of this from you, Stacy, but I'm gonna tap into it a little bit. It's all about mindset and keeping that positive mindset. And as an, as an entrepreneur, uh, getting locked in or being on, um, being in quarantine can be how some people feel on a daily basis because it can be a lonely spot to be an entrepreneur. It is what it is. Uh, and we're always preaching positivity and keeping that positive mindset and making sure that we uh, can tackle anything that comes our way. Well, this is what all those podcasts are talking about. This is the thing that comes along your way. Now, how do you respond to that? What do you do? Maybe this is a good lead in for you, Stacy. I invited her to be here. She's a real estate investor in her own right. Uh, but she does some social work. And I think on a th- therapeutic level, she put a post out on Facebook the other day, which I thought would have been perfect uh, to put on camera. So uh, that, I'll let you go. Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, basically, my thoughts are we can't control COVID-19. I mean, we we can't. We have no idea what how it will exactly play out. Um, we know it will have catastrophic um, catastrophic results in some way shape or form but what we can control is how we think about things and what we're doing on a day-to-day basis i for myself and i recommend this to my um, clients limit find out what is the right recipe for your day how much social media can you tolerate how much news certain television programs can you tolerate as well um some of the media promotes the fear um i mean they have to that's the news they get paid to show you bad things depending on the political um side they they shape the news you know to um to um for that side of things um you have to decide what recipe works for you each and every single day. Um, for me, it's limiting social media. It's limiting some of the um, news that I see and focusing on what I can do. What can I do? I can reach out to the people that, um, that I know in this industry, um, Chris, you know, the Aprils, the Whitney's, the, learning new skills that I can do going forward. Um, Reaching in and contacting my family that I haven't seen in a while, whether it is just via Zoom or FaceTime or things of that nature. Um, Focusing on things that I haven't been able to do for so long because I've been focusing on taking care of everybody else. Um, So for me, and what I recommend to others is take it on a day by day basis. Don't be so overwhelmed with the gravity of when is this going to end? See what we can do new each and every single day um, to make our lives better and to help those around us. I really think when we focus on helping each other, it becomes less of less catastrophic and more doable. You know, how can we reach out and help one another? This is really a time where we're going to see who who is really concerned about each other or who has an agenda, you know, um, who is real, who is not. And I think if we go about 
what both you, Chris, and Jean were saying is if we take that humanistic approach, we can reach so much, more, so many more people. Um, so that's just my little <laughs> chat for the day. Um, if anyone has any questions or anything or any other ideas, that would be great. You could share them. But um, really just reaching out, taking day by day, trying not to become too overwhelmed. Um, and really our mindset, our mindset is what's going to get, get us through this difficult time. No, thank you for that. I think that's well said. Um, with the news, right? You can, you can watch a story or read a story on Facebook and uh, it can stir up an emotion within five seconds, right? Exactly. To the negative or the positive. Uh, but taking the business aspect out of it um, to a point that you said in the middle there uh, about helping each other and, and learning about who you really are and, and how, the, how you're really uh, working through this or living through this. It's funny because I've seen some memes and some pictures and things like that on social media, but I see it happening outside of my living room window. I see more people outside playing with their kids. And, you know, we mm -hmm. were, I mean, let's face it, we were forced into the summer vacation overnight, <laughs> which is not, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, my girls are playing with each other and fighting less, which is really odd because they spend the day away from each other. They come back and they fight. Now they've been forced to stay home with each other. They're fighting less. Uh, the three of them helped me out with the dishes after dinner last night. Um, I'm not looking forward to an end of this. This is going great for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, though, on a serious note, thank you for that. I, when I saw your post the other day, it's, it's, it's the perfect message to put out there because whether you're an entrepreneur or you're laid off from work right now and you can't go anywhere uh, to do anything, and, you know, sometimes in that instance, it's, it's worse because we're out there, we're going to be digging around and making sure that our business runs and, and make sure that we can put food on the family's table. But somebody that's used to maybe a nine to five job and, and, and they're laid off right now, um, that window of time where you're waiting for some help. I mean, what those, those people are uh, in more dire straits mentally than, yeah. than maybe we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would like sometimes just say, as an, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. You know, say sometimes as an entrepreneur, we go all or none uh, throughout the period of an hour, uh, but then we come back again. Um, those people that are going all or none uh, mentally, um, they don't know when that next hour is going to come where they get to be positive again. Exactly. And I just suggest checking in with people in, you know, just a little bit goes such a long way because you don't know how someone else is dealing with things. I know I've been speaking to several of my staff and, you know, they're really overwhelmed because, you know, layoffs have occurred through our business and, um, my nine to five, not my real estate business. That's just me. <laughs> but um, as far as my regular nine to five, and it, it's really hard. Like I, I keep in touch with them each and every single day, just a little, like, whether it's a little emoji, how are you doing, you know, um, leave that door open, because it, it's a really difficult time um, for working America. Um, they right. don't know when their next actual paycheck, many people will come. So, and, and landlords, I think that's something that, you know, we haven't touched um, upon yet, but it's amazing. Like I'm not a landlord yet, but I do belong to many of these landlord sites and on social media. And it's amazing. Some of the fabulous outreach from some landlords and some landlords that are very cruel, um, that are only looking at the bottom line, which I get it, we all have bills to pay, but we have to be human in these times because as difficult as it may be for us, there are always people that are having it worse. Um, sure. And when we address that issue with our human nature and being kind um, while still, you know, um, you know, saying, if you have money, please, please pay me. But re uh, reaching out um, with each and every tenant, making sure that they have resources available to them, you know, because they may not know it, like Jean was saying previously, that they may not know that these certain avenues are open to them. Um, because it is overwhelming if we allow it to be. Um, so just helping each other, connecting them to the resources and 
having open dialogue, I think that is one of the best things that has come from this is ironically, even though now we're having to use the technology, conversations are being had. And I think previously um, we were just seeing people passing in the night, um, you know, going to nine to fives, going wherever it is that they're going. Now people are forced to actually have to sit down and talk to one another, whether it is via just FaceTime or actually out with their children, you know, they're interacting on different levels, getting back to the basics of life. You know, I've been seeing people playing card games on TV, you know, I mean, on social media, getting back to cooking together, getting back to doing all those simple life things and reconnecting. And I think that for me, being in the social services is phenomenal because trust me, I go into people's homes all the time and it's amazing. People can live together, but they don't actually speak to one another as much yeah. as they do. I think you hit the nail on the head with that one. I wasn't even thinking from that angle today, but uh, you're exactly right. I mean, the passing of the night is perfect. Let's use for an example, I'll call Gene out. I don't think I've spoken to him face to face in over a year, uh, but here we are talking face to face and he taught me how to make carbonara the other night. I watched one of his lives. He did a cooking show. <laughs> So yeah, oh, I, I, think I, I have right there. I have another tip. Um, tequila gets the wife in front of the camera. She will never. She would never do that, but she was feeling pretty good. So that's why I was able to get her help helping me to cook. <laughs> that's, that's not how that song goes. I know, but I just made a new version of it. It's the coronavirus version of it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I'm very shy, and Chris can tell you, and Paul or whoever has been on any Zoom calls with us. This is the first time I'm putting myself in front of the camera. Like I normally don't have my face on. Um, and I'm like, I got to put myself out there. You know, like I am challenging myself each and every day to do different things. And I think I personally will um, be putting up, you know, different videos on Facebook every day, um, just something positive, because like you said, Gene, there's not enough of that out there. Um, and it goes a long way. And you never know, just something that you're saying or something that you're doing can be inspirational to somebody else and touch their lives. Um, and, you know, that's good karma. And that will always come back, back to you. I think, I think that's awesome. You'd never know it was your first time on camera. I think it'd be great. Really? Oh, I am really? Public speaking, you know, but not on camera. So, <laughs> uh, can I change directions for a second, Lewis? I see you sitting over there. Um, I know you do some investing. You're a realtor as well, aren't you? Hey, Chris and everyone. Thanks for uh, having me here. Um, I'm not a realtor, even though yeah, I have okay. taken the classes uh, to become one. Um, but it's more to learn the laws and then the ins and outs of things uh, since I'm a landlord and I wholesale also. Okay, I got you. Well, how yeah. about Gene? I know you, you talk with a lot of realtors. Uh, uh, anything you're seeing in the last week or two as far as, uh, I know it's not business as usual, but what are you seeing on, on the traditional side? So I'm actually shocked at how many deals are still going through, if I'm being honest. And I, I have... Uh, people th from across the country. So I'm talking to a lot of people, even as far as right outside of San Francisco, I got a friend out there, Greg, who's a, an agent in, it's called uh, Danville, Col uh, yeah, Danville, Colorado, right outside San Francisco, Danville, California. <laughs> and with the lockdown that Sam Fran's been on, I figured they shut that down three weeks ago, but he just signed like a $1.8 million listing, like literally four days ago. Uh, so it's interesting to find, I think, it's half and half. Some of the people are, are frightened. It's almost like bugs that scatter. You know, you got the brave cockroaches that are like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm going to stand here. Where the other ones run underneath the refrigerator, right? I think a lot of agents are, are scaring themselves into seclusion and into stopping their daily routine. But the ones that are out there are actually seeing deals happen. I mean, if, you, if we're honest, if you get one brave soul to buy in the next two months, that probably covers you for the two months in a lot of cases, right? Yeah, right. So you keep pushing. It's like... At this point, your barrier of entry has, has 
gone down a little bit because you don't need to make 30 grand. You just need to be able to pay the mortgage this month, you know? So I'm, I'm actually, over the last week, I'm pretty surprised at how much business has gone on as usual. That's what I'm seeing. I think it's, it'll taper off in the next three weeks probably, but that's what I'm seeing right now. Well, that's great. I mean, uh, that's actually an interesting way to think of it. Think of it this way. If you want to talk on a positive note, we put a listing up a month ago, maybe you get, 10 people walk through, it only really takes one to purchase your house, right? So maybe now the one that's really interested in buying that house is the one appointment that you get and you make that offer. So maybe the numbers aren't skewed. It's just the people that aren't truly interested are staying at home and not going to see it in the first place. Because if you, if you do on a case by case basis and just go by, um, by the number of appointments that you're getting, then, you know, that can freak you out. You know, I, I know we had, we had one a few weeks ago that had, multiple showings in one day. And then we just put one up last week that had two so far. Um, but maybe one of those two is a buyer. So it, it doesn't always have to be the doom and gloom. Uh, but Lewis, yeah, uh, wholesaling. This is this is a perfect message for you. We're, we're still buying, so yeah. you keep buying too. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, same here. Um, my question is though, what, do you guys know of any title companies that are open? Um, or like, how would we just put them under contract and wait until things open up? And yeah, so we like primarily how, how work are you guys with, approaching that? We primarily right now. work with Stewart and Why I'm Missing, and okay. uh, I know they're not allowing anybody into the building that doesn't work there right now. But it's not stopping okay. them from doing business. We're kind of working with them hand in hand to come up with something creatively to start some of this virtual closing, if you will, as virtual as we can get. Um, okay. I know moving forward, I know it's probably not the best practice to be FaceTiming a signature, but you do what you got to mm -hmm. do in the moment and then you figure out what's going to work long term. So we're, we're, we're trying to work with, they are open, but we're not, we're not uh, allowed in the building. Okay. Lewis, I'm I, I'm sorry, I might send you something that I want to go see today uh, later when okay. we get off here. Yeah, 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 so I'll, I'll also add that, you know, choosing the title company or finding the title company that's going to do what you need them to do that's secondary to getting the contract and the signature on the page right so mm -hmm. you kind of want to from a mindset standpoint worry about one problem in front of you at a time kind of thing there okay. are title companies that are out there that'll do business um i know relative to my local county we can start the process but there's a hang up because we can't get certain tax certificates because those government agencies are closed down so uh, okay. You know, there's, there's a lot that can be done and there's some stuff that can't be done. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll argue, just don't, don't worry about getting it to the finish line. Let, let's mm -hmm. worry about step one and let's get the, let's meet the contact. Let's meet the seller. Mm -hmm. Let's solve their problem. Let's put it on paper. We'll, and then we'll find somebody else we can work with. That's going to get the signatures at the end of the day. And all that. Yeah. Yeah. That's because a good process, point. that process might take two weeks and in two weeks you might have a ban lifted, but you know, you shouldn't let that stop you from doing your normal course of business. Thank you. I think oh, one thing we're doing is that if, if the seller is not actually in a serious hurry with everything going on, we've discussed uh, just making longer settlement dates. So, mm -hmm. you know, stretching it out okay. to like six, eight weeks just to get them under contract. Only, you know, if the seller is, comfortable with that that's something that we've been considering that's good yeah yeah just uh just a note here and you might want to do a little research on this I, I heard i read very quickly and briefly today that i saw that pennsylvania is looking to enact an, a, a virtual signing law for real estate I, I don't know what the details but and i was just googling it right now i haven't seen anything but i feel like over the next couple of days there's a guy that i'm friends with todd polinchuk who's like the national so um Pennsylvania Association of Realtors president, I think. And he's also, do you know Todd, Paul? Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. they, they went direct to Tom Wolf and said, listen, we, <laughs> we still got to do business here, guys. So how <laughs> can we bridge this gap while keeping social distancing in play? Um, and, and they're working on passing that legislation. Yeah, I read that this morning, I think. So you might, if you want to go follow him, he's, he's been doing a great job. Of, I, I don't even know what political party he is. I just happen to have met him a couple times and he's been putting some really good nonpartisan information out about what's going on at the state level and this was one of the things i saw the other day so or today i forget what it was yeah i mean look at what kind of doors that opens up moving forward if you just oh uh, so many doors right like maybe you 
do away with deed packages and FedExes and, and running somebody out of state to the notary and overnighting that and making sure it's back on your desk by noon. All that goes away with, a, with an option like that. Well, and it's much bigger too. I mean, when you've got multi-million dollar deals that are on the table, um, you know, for example, there's an Amazon that's going in and there's tons and tons of tax credits that Amazon's providing that local township that they need in order to maintain their continuing operational in their budget. So when the deals like that go on stop, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. So that helps juice the wheels from the state level to say, guys, we, we got to keep this going. So it's, um, yeah. but it, it's great because it trickles down to us guys like that. Yeah, the, yeah, the world is changing right now. It's, it's and it's happening quick. Like my kids are e-learning right now, and I said, I know this sucks, but say goodbye to snow days. There's no more reason for snow days, right? Like you, you're gonna be you're gonna be virtual learning. Great, go sledding, but you got to be back at twelve fifteen for your math test. You know, <laughs> everything's changing. Chris and the rest of you, what are you guys seeing as as in um, private lending? What what are you guys hearing from the private lenders at this well, point? I could probably speak to that. I talked to three different private lenders yesterday. Um, well, actually four. Um, the majority of them are very hesitant to enter into a deal unless there's two conditions that are met. One, that the lender or the, the borrower has some skin in the game. So where normally they would offer 100% across the board, 100% purchase, 100% rehab, 100% closing. Now they want 10% down or some cash in the deal. So that's scenario number one for them. Scenario number two is they want more than usual fat on the bone. So where we might go to a lender and say, listen, you know, my numbers are conservative and I'm going to walk away with $15,000. Um, now they're looking at it and saying, no, 25. Um, I want to see fat on the bone um, because there's uncertainty. Some of them feel like they're, this is, the greatest recipe for a market correction um, in the housing prices and they're anticipating, two of them are anticipating, um, their thought is that housing prices are gonna come down by 10 to 15%, um, which wouldn't at all surprise me. I, 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 I support that logic, but um, so as a result, they're asking for more skin in the game or more skin in the game or much more fat on the bone relative to flipping um, or, um, or a really good substantial uh, exit strategy if it's like a, a, buy, uh, a buy and hold in a refi situation. So they're looking for more conservative ARV numbers. That's At least that's out of the four lenders that I talked to yesterday. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we haven't had anybody hesitate yet. Uh, I, I would see it coming if it, if it lasted any longer. But to your point, I think that's important for us to, I mean, on a normal basis, you, your job is to keep your lender comfortable with your deal and keep that open communication between the both of you. So I would almost as a business owner want to get ahead of them on that question and say, look, this is how our business is going to run for the next month or two. We're looking at maybe some lower ARVs. We're going to, we're going to pull this in the last six months like we usually do, but we're going to take a percentage off of that. We're going to buy a little bit deeper. We're going to make sure there's, there's more meat on the bone, as you say, and make them feel comfortable with you before they have to put that, that term in place for you. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, then, th then they know you're thinking of this the right way. And look, we're, we're all in this to make money. We're all in this to succeed together. We're all in this to help the same seller out. Uh, but these are the, the measures we're going to put into place to make sure we can keep doing that consistently. And, and that's kind of the message we wanted to put out there to our lenders. And from the offer standpoint, I can say that, you know, I'm making my offers at a lower price than I normally would. Say three weeks ago, I might have offered, I don't know, 60 on a property where now I'm offering like, you know, 51 or 52. Um, and I can use the current world, say the world situation as a justification for why I'm, you know, a little lower on my offer price simply because, you know, you know, I'm stepping into your shoes. There's a little uncertainty as to what I'm going to be able to do. You know, if banks are going to come back and allow me to refi. So it's, it, it gives me at least I feel like this situation has given me a little bit more leverage to lower my price, um, which then allows me to get, have more than two exit strategies. Now I've got three, right? I can, I can rehab it, rent it, refi it. I can wholesale it. I can flip it and have more profit structure. So um, it's just about setting yourself up for success on the front end more so than you normally would, I guess. Sure. 
I can I can actually speak to that because the conversations on the sales side to sellers are getting a lot easier because they realize that you know they're they're stuck in front of the TV all day watching the same news. So what else can you do? Yeah, uh, they know that you know if they hear that there may be a hit on the housing market or there may be. And I've heard how many times have you heard the word recession? Whether you believe it's going to happen or not, how many times have you heard it on TV the past week? I, you know, I dream about the word recession. Um, and if if they're in a belief that they may happen and they still need to sell their house, then that conversation is easier to have. This is that fine line of helping somebody out versus taking advantage of them. Cause there are people out there that are going to take full advantage of that and, and buy at ridiculous prices because, you know, I won't sure. get on the soapbox well, with that, but it happens. If I, if you don't mind, if I just jump in, I don't really see it as taking advantage by buying deeper because you're really, protecting yourself anyway. So, I mean, we're not scare tactic people. So we're not calling and saying, hey, you better sell me your house, there's gonna be a recession. But the reality is, if there is, you know, it has to be at the forefront of everybody's mind. So it's not taking advantage, it's just protecting you your and your lender's asset or whatever. Sure. So, no, I'm not saying we were taking advantage, I'm saying there are people that will because oh, yeah. of these easier conversations that can happen. I will say, so I've had three conversations with three different sellers in the last three, three days. And out of those conversations, I was a little surprised at how almost naive some of those sellers were relative to the actual, of what's going on and how that's going to eventually trickle down to potentially affect their housing's value. Um, so I was a little surprised by that. I'm, I'm guessing I'm probably going to see more of that. Um, people that are kind of out of touch with how that trickles down to the housing market. How are you guys um, adjusting your ARV at this time? Because we don't know exactly how the market is, is going to play out. So what are you doing to protect yourselves with a safe ARV? So, so I can say that I'm, I'm a conservative guy. <laughs> So, you know, if I'm pulling comps and one of them is 100 and the other two are 130 and 150, I'm going with 100. Um, so in my standpoint, I'm assuming a 15% correction. Um, I'm conservative. If it only settles out to be 5 or 10%, great. That's upside. Um, and if, if that changes by the time we get to the closing table and I can throw the seller more money and it's, it's good across the board, hey, why not? Um, but... The short answer is I'm using 15%. That's probably a little aggressive, but you know, I'd rather be safe than, than sorry. That's just me. Sure. I think uh, for us, we've, we've had a conversation. We haven't solidified anything yet because it's so fresh. You have to come up with something immediate and adjust later as needed. Uh, we've talked about five to 10% and I don't think we've agreed on a number yet, but we will. Uh, the, the thing is that the market was really so good and steady up until this this happened, that the ARVs you're pulling now, uh, which we typically do six months back, are great numbers. We just can't expect that to be there a month or two from now. So come up with something, and conservative is okay. Come up with something that's going to work for you for the next two to four weeks, right? And then make sure that two to four weeks from now, you readjust and, and take a look at your market and then see some of the houses that you didn't necessarily put under contract, but you analyzed. And what happened with those houses? What happened with the comps around those houses? And maybe now more than ever, you want to pull rather than the solds, pull the actives, see where they're listed and see what they actually sell for. Because then that's going to start creating your new ARVs as you go forward. Yeah, so I mean, Chris and I, we split the business in half. I don't know how many of you actually know that, but I run the construction side of the business. So when it comes time to list the properties, I'm constantly looking at the value of what's going on as each month passes even as i'm rehabbing i'm like okay are we still going to be able to sell it for the same amount and i have adjusted my rehab based on the numbers that i see i think that um if you plan for it ahead of time um you know in in terms of the difference between do i really need to fix that and do i have to fix that is just something that i'm looking at now so that you know where we were a month ago when we were going to buy a property now i'm reevaluating what i would be doing because i think at the end of the day we're going to have to adjust between five and ten percent i again i don't know that i it, it, 
price point makes a big difference. 10% on a $500,000 house is a lot. <laughs> so, so I think it just depends on the neighborhood. I would also add that um, just because you don't have a lot of room right now with what they're willing to take and what the ARV is, um, it doesn't mean that a few days from now or even a week from now, they, that won't change. Um, I had a seller go from 200,000 on a fiveplex to now we're 130 in like four days, 130,000 on, on a fiveplex. And I feel like if it, it can go down even more because it's just the nature of things and people are realizing that we don't not, we don't know where this is going to go. So if that have something that was a benefit for them in the past, now is probably a burden. Um, if it's not generating them income and we are able to provide, which ties into what we said earlier, our why, we're able to provide a solution in the midst of all of that. No, that's so, exactly right. Yeah. And I think in, in some cases you're going to see uh, just that. You're going to see the, uh, the fear promote motivation. Mm -hmm. And where did my screen go? There we go. Uh, fear will provoke motiva motivation in some cases, uh, and that may be what's happening there because the uh, the unknown, the future, nobody knows what's going to happen. It's almost it's almost like somebody's selling off their stocks in the stock market because it's going down that day. They don't know if it's going to go back up tomorrow, but for fear of losing even more money, they're going to mm -hmm. get out now, and that's kind of that's kind of what you're going to see sometimes, uh, yeah. especially in that situation. So now's the time to buy. <laughs> <laughs> I think on the rehab side at the end, you know, with ARV, you know, in the last year we saw that everybody, people would put stuff out there that is like top dollar. That's really shit. Like they did like a really bad rehab or they did nothing. Right. It looks like the grandma's house with the bad carpet. And I think if we put out a good product and do a great flip, you can still get that ARV you were planning on from before the virus because it's now the one that's going to stand out between all the others in that same price range. Well, I was well, considering wholetailing a little bit. Sorry, Chris. I mean, we oh, were yeah. just talking about whole wholetailing just to get um, uh, just to get a few of them off the books quickly because I, I still think sometimes even with that being the case. Um, it's just an easier way to get things sold without putting a bunch of money into it. Yeah, I mean, you I think time has a, a big mm -hmm. emphasis on this. So we need to prepare for things like this, but it can't be the end all be all because uh, miraculously, let's say this thing turns around in the next month. We're really not going to see, there'll be a ripple effect. We're not really going to see that hard of a hit on the real estate market. It'll come back uh, maybe just as fast as it went down. So, it's not going to be this um, this avalanche of prices falling down. So although we need to prepare for it, I don't think we make it a staple uh, until we actually need to see that on, you know, you're going to pay closer attention in a shorter period of time, meaning that two to four weeks uh, and make sure you adjust your ARVs accordingly there. But really, I mean, time is the factor there, uh, whether you're going to make that a fix in your business for the next six months or not. I agree. Yeah, we'll see what, um, I mean, I think on the seller side, remember now the people have, because they own, they have 0% interest or very close to nothing. Now they can actually buy a bigger house than they wanted to. You know, people only yeah. care about what their monthly payment is. So now all of a sudden for that same monthly payment, now they can get a bigger house. And uh, the per people, you know, obviously if somebody was laid off and they have, um, you know, problems financially or some hookup, you know, they are not going to continue buying a house. But if somebody was ready to pull the trigger on a house and they are financially sound, I bet you they'll continue doing it. I mean, they... Yeah, well, I think that's the thing. I mean, as long as the interest rates stay low, people are still going to buy. And I, I think we'll be fine. It's going to be a couple months. I think it'll be a little bit of a slowdown and then we'll bounce yeah. back. I was worried on the sales side, like how, you know, what if this thing sits all of a sudden, you know, because if you start a rehab now, you're three months till you have it on the market. Well, my advice on that would be just 
account for a holder a longer hold time than what you were doing. So anything we have on the market now, I know I'm going to hold it for another payment or two, but I'm okay with that because, you know, we'll still make money. So I'm assuming where we were in and out of a rehab and, you know, buy to buy was four months. Now I'm going to account for six months. That way my interest payments is accounted for and then we'll buy just a little deeper based on that. Right. Can I switch gears too? Yeah. Unless you guys already talked about this, uh, marketing, is anybody changing their message? Before you get to that, I have a question for you. What's, uh, and I should know this, but I know what's uptailing or upscaling with the oh, wholesaling or wholesaling. Wholesaling. What, what is that? It's when you um, put a very, either you put a house right back on the market or you do something like paint and you throw it back on the market or you fix it. Oh, so roof. just minimal rehab and put it back on yeah. the market. Oh, yeah. God. Gotcha. But then now you're still selling it at a discount. At a discount. Okay. Yeah. But you're, you're able to get your pay from the difference from where you bought it for it to where you sell obviously so, so you're not on the negative yeah so basically um if i can just throw some paint on the inside of a house and it's livable um and i i would mark it up to a point where i would still make my profit or you know 20 to thirty thousand. to me that's a successful hotel and you're still you know selling it under um, what would be your arb but yeah, you're still offering I the house at a discount because it's not fully yeah. rehabbed with all the headache of uh, f fixing it up and dealing with contractors, all that. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes these houses are a full gut, obviously, but sometimes you're walking through a house that's completely livable, but maybe the carpet needs changed out and some paint on the walls. So mm -hmm. rather than put the thirty or 40000 into it to make thirty or 40000 at your top ARV, it may be worth your while to put the ten or fifteen into it. And then, you know, uh, sell, let's say I was going to assume to sell a full – rehab at 200,000. Now we put the 10 or 15 into it and we're able to put it on the market for 155 uh, mm -hmm. and still make our profit. That sometimes that's worth it. Mm -hmm. Less hold times too, right? You can get it in and out of that. If you can get it back in the market within a month, you're talking about maybe two or three months holding it rather than, you know, five to six months. Okay. <clears throat> Gene, Did you guys Gene touch in, in space now, I believe? Huh? I think Gene's in space now. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys touch cool into background. marketing or did I miss that? Uh, we didn't as far as changing the message. Uh, do you want to talk to that or do you want me to talk to that? Well, I mean, I was just going to say that we were going to change our message, but not to a large degree, but just, you know, we know that times are tough right now and that we are still in business and, you know, we're here for anybody that needs us. And, mm. you know, also the, the original message that we had sent out too. So I don't know if anyone was adjusting in that way. Yeah, basically just from the conversations we had and digging into our database and letting people know that we're still here and we can still help you out, even if it's um, even if it's over the phone, you know, that's kind of the message we want to portray on our postcards. On the, our next round is going to go out, I believe, next week and just changing maybe a line to, to let them know that we don't necessarily have to meet in person uh, to help you out. So still feel free to call or text us as usual because um, just that simple message from the people we reached out to on our side, they said, Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize you'd still be doing this. We were going to wait until after, you know, we have your postcard maybe, but we were going to wait until after the lockdown was lifted to be, to call you. So, so, no, we're here. We can still do this. And that's the message we want to put in their mailbox as they go together. Yeah. I'm finding from my side that people are very, very, very reluctant to be salesy. Like when we were sending out like newsletters or posting stuff on their feeds, they're real cautious about like, you know, don't talk about the spring market. You know, what we want more, more along the lines of things you can do to help yourself around the house. And so they're very cognizant of the fact that I think most people probably don't want to be sold right now. And so, but, but, but by the same token, I think it's really important. Like you just said, Chris, Oh, you really are still doing that. They're not going to know unless you tell them. So you got to find a subtle way to make sure they know you're still out there doing business, maybe not as usual doing business as unusual, but you're still there to help them. And um, if you need anything, call me. Right. Yep. 
Uh, we're coming up on an hour now. I don't know if anybody has anything else. Um, but this is great. I, I mean, this is exactly what I wanted. Kind of put your own angle on this. Uh, Stacey, yeah, thank, thank you, you for coming on and talking about that. The mindset part of it. And you got to do more camera stuff. You do really good. Agreed. All right, guys. Yeah, thanks uh, for putting it together, Chris. Good seeing your face. Yeah, now. yeah you, you too. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Lewis, the Hang on one second. Don't. Don't sign off yet. I think Rob has something to say. Can you unmute him real quick? Oh, is he the guy on the phone? Sure. Yeah, he's the guy on the phone. There you go. You're open. Can you hear? Can you yeah, guys hear good. me? Sorry, I came in late. Uh, you may have touched on this earlier, but maybe not. Um, I know you, you're talking about your marketing strategies. Have you guys actually spoken to your individual lenders? Because I'm, as a lender myself, I'm a little nervous myself and. You know, I'd hate to see you guys line up five properties and then get to your lenders and like, well, we're not going to lend right now till things kind of settle down. Have you talked to any of them or got their feelings on lending? Yeah, we kind of tapped into that a little bit before. Um, I know Mel had a conversation with you. Um, I, I kind of heard a mix in here. Uh, some lenders are maybe not willing to lend at the moment. Some are just tightening up their terms a bit. Um, and just my my message to that was to put put that message in front of you as, as, as a lender, I would want to reach out to you and let you know what our business practices are going forward. What are we going to do to be a little more cautious, if you will? Uh, although we don't want to stop doing business, we have to do it smart. So if we put a good plan together and you feel comfortable with that, then, then that's, it's always going to be an individual conversation with each lender, but uh, your comfort is the most important part of that or else we, we can't move forward with that deal. So right now we're right. assuming longer hold times based on maybe houses sitting just a little bit longer on the market. And we're going to probably be listing a little less than what we originally had assumed. So I and I will make up right. for that in the rehab. In the rehab. And then what about like the contractors? I guess that's an individual thing where some of the contractors are not working at all now. You know, how, how long are we expecting until contractors actually can go back to work? Well, my contract there seems to be a gray work. area in there where <laughs> I've seen that there seems to be a, a, a real gray area there, uh, whether you want to consider yourself a building contractor or a fixer upper, if you will. All uh, right. I've, I've seen some verbiage out there where they can work if, if, if you're considered a, it's, I'm drawing a blank on it. If you're considered just a, a go to the house and fix something person, then, then you can go do that. Um, which is like a hand basically what a handyman. Yeah, there you go. So that's basically what we hire for our projects. So I don't know what, what are they considered? They're handymen to me. I'll consider paying the fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hallelujah you know what? to that. <laughs> My husband Please. is a contractor, as some of you know, and it, it's a very gray area. Um, what, what we're operating under at this point is you know he's not advertising but the, he's having a dialogue with his consumer um uh, with his clients um are you comfortable with me coming out are you not comfortable with me coming out um this is what i'll do to keep you safe um again having that communication with his with his clients um and going from there um he's not a builder and that is the you know the major thing that has been shut down um but until we get more definition on it um he's moving forward you know um and you know it, it just comes down to the clients and what they want done and, and that type of thing trying to be smart and and hoping that you know if someone does come and you know try to shut him down that okay he gets a warning um you know not being adversary with that person you know having a dialogue with them um and he has applied for the waiver so we're hoping that you know that will will um we're hoping that that will get approved I, i've heard of some other contractors in the philadelphia area that have applied for the waiver and have it has been granted so um we're hoping that you know, he'll get that as well. I can definitely see that being more of an issue in maybe an occupied property, uh, house calls, if you will. Uh, some of our, you know, a rehab is, is going to be a vacant house. Maybe you have one or two guys in if you're, if you're subcontracting. 
jobs. So maybe that's kind of a loophole that, that keeps them working, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, we want, we want our guys working and that's how they get paid too. Um, yeah, that's like you said, it's a, it's a gray area and we've seen it both ways posted and talked about on TV. So I'm, I'm not really too sure. I think our guys are still working, right, Mel? You have that side. <laughs> yeah, they're working. It's, <clears throat> I mean, our guys are, we're wrapping up a couple projects, so we're pretty much done at this point. But for the most part, until they get caught, they're working. I'd rather beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. There you That's go, it. Paul. Exactly right. Well, you know what? If, if they're able to go out and do handyman one-off jobs, you say, let's let, let the fuse blew in my panel. So he came out to check it out. And while he was there, just replaced the panel and all the wiring in the house. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why he did it. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that we're, the only trouble we're running into right now is um, if they need to pick up um, supplies. Like the one project I do have, which happens to be Rob's project. <laughs> That one yeah. just needs landscaping, and he can't get the material because all this the places where the material is picked up is closed. So, I mean, at oh. this point, we're just assuming a longer hold time, like I said. And if it means paying a little, you know, a few extra payments, I mean, realistically, it could mean one, maybe two extra payments. So, for me, it's, I mean, we'll be fine. I mean, that's right. eight weeks. Right. Well, because it was bought correctly in, in the beginning. And um, you'd like the extra payments, no? <laughs> oh, me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose. Okay. No, I'd rather just get done. It, it's weird that, like, a landscaper, like, they're, you know, talking about large groups. You've got two landscapers out doing mulch and something. I don't see how that's, like, a high-risk, you know, type of gathering. And that I do question you know, them shutting down companies like that. But I think it's more so right. the suppliers, right? Not the landscapers. Oh, the supply. Okay, the suppliers. Yeah, yeah, well, they can't get their stone and they can't get their mulch because all those companies have shut down. Uh, I saw mulch delivering yesterday in my area. So I, I guess it's just, if you call it around, you might be able to find other people, but I guess it just depends. I saw A1 mulch delivering out near me. Oh, okay. Well, but, maybe I'll look into that more. I think that's considered transportation, isn't it? <laughs> that's an essential business. Well, <laughs> it was transporting mulch. That's uh, still transportation. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, I think we'll wrap this up. We've been uh, over an hour, but uh, I mean, thanks everybody for uh, coming on here. I think there was a lot of good stuff. Was it? Awesome. <laughs> you got to you got to put a mirror in front of that. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, dude. All right, thanks for All coming right, thanks, on. Guys. We'll, we'll see you guys. You. All right, bye. Bye-bye.